In this lesson, we're going to learn about clock reactions. So what exactly are clock reactions? Clock reactions are actually speed of reaction experiments um, where we measure the time taken for a fixed amount of a product to form. And the product is usually colored. Now the two most common reactions that are often used as clock reactions would be uh, as shown. The first one producing sulfur, which is a yellow solid. All right, and the second one producing iodine, which is a brown solution. Now in the very, very first lesson, we learn that speed of reaction can be defined in two ways. Speed of reaction can either be defined as the change in the amount of reactants with time or it can be defined as the change in the amount of products with time. So for clock reactions, we are looking at the change in products with time. Now that we have established that clock reactions, for clock reactions, we are focusing on the speed of reaction in terms of amount of product form over time taken. There are still two ways in which we can conduct the experiment. The first way is where we fix the duration. And then we measure the amount of product form during that fixed duration. So a faster reaction would produce a greater amount of solid during the same time period. The second way to carry out the experiment is now to fix the amount of solid or product form. All right, and then we measure the time taken for this fixed amount of solid to form. Now for clock reactions, um, most of the time we are looking at the second um, method of conducting the experiment. So we will fix the amount of product to be formed in, in all the different experimental runs. And then we're going to measure the time taken for this fixed amount of product to form. Right? So for a faster reaction, it's going to take a shorter time to form a fixed amount of product. So uh, we are going to look at this particular um, reaction between sodium thiosulfate and hydrochloric acid. The product of this reaction is sulfur. Sulfur is a yellow solid. So how do we conduct this experiment is that we'll mix the two solutions in a conical flask. All right, we'll mix the two solutions, sodium thiosulfate and hydrochloric acid into a conical flask. And then we're going to put it on a piece of white paper with a cross written on it. So what happens is that as the reaction proceeds, you get more and more of the sulfur being formed. And sulfur is a yellow solid. So increasingly, the solution is going to become less and less transparent or more and more opaque. And there will come a time when we cannot see the cross anymore. And that's when we will stop the stopwatch and that would represent the time taken for a certain amount of sulfur to form. Now this is an example of the different experimental runs that is usually conducted for such an experiment. So if you take a look at the experimental parameters, you will notice that the volume of P which is sodium thiosulfate decreases from experiment one to experiment five, All right? And the other reactant, which is hydrochloric acid, the volume actually remains constant. So essentially, what does this change? Or what is changed from experiment one to five is that the concentration of P will decrease from experiment one experiment 5. All right, so of the five experiments, you can expect the experiment 5 
to have the lowest speed of reaction because it has the lowest concentration of the reactant and experiment one to have the highest speed of reaction because it has the highest concentration. Now again, um, since we are measuring the time taken for a fixed amount of product to form, the experiment with the highest speed will have the shortest time. Whereas the experiment with the lowest speed will take the longest time. Now a key feature of clock reactions is that the total volume of reactants must be constant. So if you can recall from the previous set of experimental parameters, the total volume is fixed at 60 cm3. All right, in experiments where a smaller volume of P was used, uh, we actually top up the volume with deionized water. Now why is it that the total volume of the reactants must be constant? There are two reasons for that. The first one is, where, um, is so that the amount of product form for all five experimental runs is the same. Now if we don't use the same volume of solutions, then it will take a different amount of sulfur. For example, if you compare the two um, experimental setups that I've shown, experiment two has a larger volume of solution. So the one with the experimental run with a larger volume of solution will require more sulfur to obscure the cross. All right, so in this case, uh, we are not fixing the amount of products form anymore. So in order to fix the amount of product form from experiment one to experiment five, we must make sure that the total volume remains constant. Now the second reason why the total volume of reactants must be constant is so that the concentration of P in the final reaction mixture is directly proportional to the volume of P that was used in in that experiment. All right, so simply by analyzing the volume of P, I can tell that experiment one has the highest concentration. And then the experiment five is the least concentrated. All right, and not only that, we can actually um, say that the concentration of P is actually proportional to the volume of P. Now the analogy is like that. For example, I'm trying to make a Milo solution. Right? I'm trying to make a Milo solution. So um, if I have five different or uh, four different containers, all right, and to each container I vary the number of packets of instant Milo that I add. First one I add one packet, second I'll add two, the third one I'll add three, and then the fourth one I'll add four. Now, in order for the concentration of Milo to be proportional to the number of packets used, I must ensure that all four containers must be filled up with water to the same volume. All right, if the volume of water added is different, the concentration of Milo is no longer a function or is no longer directly proportional. To the number of packets used. So the same concept is being applied in this case. So for clock of reaction experiments, uh, the graph that we will plot will be time against volume of P, where time is the dependent variable, is the one that we measure uh, for each experimental run, uh, against volume of P, which is the independent variable, the variable that we vary from experiment one to experiment five. Now, why is it that um, we plot time against volume of P? We can actually understand it from the equation for speed of reaction. So once again, speed of reaction equals to the amount of product form over time taken. And the feature of clock reactions is that the amount of product form in all experimental runs are constant. All right, so that being a constant, um, for this part of the equation, 
um, we only need to look at 1 over t as the variable. How about speed of reaction? We have learned that speed of reaction depends on the concentration of the reactant. In this case, uh, for experiment 1 to 5, the concentration of P was changed. And in just the previous slide, we saw that the concentration of P is actually proportional to the volume of P since the total volume of solution in all five experimental runs are kept constant. Hence, speed of reaction can be represented by volume of P, which is the other variable that we'll look at. Now we need to rearrange the equation slightly um, to make T the y-axis. So we'll get this, all right? So if you were to plot y against x, which is um, p, the kind of graph that we will get is like a one y equals to 1 over x graph, which will look something like this. So if you want to get a straight line for um, clock reactions, or for such kinds of experiments where you measure time taken for a fixed amount of product to form, we have to plot, we have to rearrange the equation. Again, um, we are going to make 1 over t as the y-axis, and then we'll have vp over k, where k is a constant. So in this case, if we were to plot 1 over t, against vp you will find that now this will give us a straight line that passes through the origin